Canberra is a quiet, sleepy town in the province of Artois, with some historical memories to its name. Ancient, narrow streets snake around the beleaguered town hall, the time-turned city gates and the many churches where the great Fenelon preached. Powerful towers rise above a maze of pointed roofs. Wide alleys lead to a well-kept park, which is adorned with a monument to the pilot Bleriot. Its inhabitants are quiet, friendly people, leading a cosy existence in spacious, modest-looking, but richly furnished houses. Many rentiers settle here at the end of their lives, not without reason the town has a title. Les Vildildes millionaires, even before the war there were more than forty of them here. The Great War tore the quiet nest from its fairy tale slumber, turning it into the hearth of a gigantic battle. The hurried new life rattled along the bumpy sidewalk, the small windows rattled, and frightened faces lurked behind them. Strangers emptied the carefully filled cellars, threw themselves into the spacious mahogany beds, constantly disturbing the blissful peace of the common people, who, gathering in groups in the midst of the disturbed surroundings, whispered to each other all sorts of passions and reliable rumours about the nearness of the final victory of their countrymen. The troops lived in a barracks, and the officers were quartered on the Rue de Lene. During the time of our presence the street became like a student quarter. Talks through the windows, night singing and little adventures were what we engaged in. Every morning exercises were held on the large plats near the village of Fontaine, which later became famous. My duties were to my liking. Connell von Oppen had entrusted me with the formation and training of an assault group. My apartment was in the highest degree pleasant. My hosts, a handsome couple of Planco Bolan jewellers, seldom missed an opportunity to send me upstairs for dinner something delicious. In the evening we drank tea together, played tricourse and chatted. Most often, of course, we discussed the hard-to-answer question of why people fight wars. During these hours, the good Mr. Planco was happy to share all sorts of tales of the idle and humorous inhabitants of Cambrai who had caused thunderous laughter in the streets, in the taverns and in the marketplace in the old days. It all reminded me of Uncle Benjamin, a lover of such things. Thus, one day a certain prankster sent an invitation to all the hunchbacks in the neighbourhood to appear before a notary about an inheritance case. At the appointed hour, hiding behind the window of a house across the street with a few friends, he enjoyed the rare sight of seventeen angry, screaming kobolds charging at the unfortunate notary. There was also a good story about an old hag living nearby, characterised by a strangely crooked neck. Twenty years ago, everyone knew her as a girl who wanted to marry at all costs. Six young men had conspired, and each had willingly secured permission to ask for her hand in marriage from her parents. On the following Sunday a large carriage arrived, in which all six of them were seated, each with a bouquet in his hand. The maiden was terrified and locked herself in the house, while the varmints made an outrage in the street for the amusement of the neighbours. A young, notorious Cambrisian appears at the market and asks a peasant woman, pointing to a round, soft, appetisingly sprinkled with green onions cheese. No. How much is this cheese? Hmm. Twenty sous, sir. He gives her twenty sous. Is this cheese mine now? Of course, sir. And I can do whatever I want with it. Of course you can. Slap. He throws the cheese in her face and leaves her stunned and walks away. On July 25, we said goodbye to this glorious town and headed north to Flanders. We knew from the newspapers that artillery battles had been raging there for a week, the likes of which had never been seen before in the history of the world. We landed in Staden to the distant rumble of cannonade and marched across a landscape new to us to the Ondankliger position. To the left and right of the military road were rich, manicured fields and lush, wet, hedge-lined meadows, Scattered in the distance were peasant yards with low thatched and tiled roofs, with bundles of tobacco leaves hanging on the walls to dry. The villagers we met on the way looked like Germans, and they spoke in a simple dialect that reminded us of our homeland. All the second half of the day we spent in the gardens of peasant farms, which sheltered us from the eyes of enemy pilots. At times powerful shells, fired from the ship's guns, passed over our heads with a distant clatter and exploded nearby. Such a shell hit one of the many small streams and killed the soldiers of the 91st Regiment who were bathing in it. Toward evening, with a team sent forward, I went to the reserve battalion's position to prepare replacements and instruct my men. We marched to the reserve battalion by Huthelster Forest and the village of Koki, and on the way we were several times out of step because of heavy shells.
In the darkness I heard the voice of one recruit. Hmm. But the lieutenant never hides. He knows better. An older man corrected him. If a shell really comes this way, he'll be the first to hide. Hide in a shelter only if you have to, but then instantly. However, the degree of necessity can be correctly assessed only by an experienced person, who by instinct feels the end point of the trajectory before a beginner hears a slight vibration of the air. Our guides not quite, it seems. Confident in their actions led us along an interminably long trench, the so-called box which, because of groundwater, is not dug deep, but is lined on the ground in the form of a tunnel of sandbags and fascines. Then we passed an ominously ragged forest, from which, according to the story of the guides, the regimental headquarters had been knocked out a couple of days ago by so little as a thousand ten-inch shells. It seems we shall get quite a lot here, I thought to myself. Then we trudged without path or road through the dense undergrowth, and finally losing our guides, halted helplessly in a thicket of reeds. Surrounded by a swampy marsh, on the black mirror of which the light of the moon was breaking. Explosions were continually heard, and the upwardly heaving Tina was slapped savorously back into the water. At last the unfortunate guide on whom we had vented all our anger returned and announced that he had found the way. Nevertheless we wandered again till we reached the ambulance dugout. Above it, very near, at short intervals, shrapnel slammed twice. Bullets and splinters whistling through the bows, the doctor on duty gave us a judicious man, and he drove us to the shelter where the reserve commander was sitting. I immediately went on to a company of the 225th Regiment, which was to be replaced by our second, and after a long search in the crater-riddled terrain found several ruined houses, inconspicuously stuffed with reinforced concrete from the inside. One of them had been crumpled by a heavy shell the day before, and the crew, finding themselves locked in, had been crushed by a collapsed roof. I spent the rest of the night in the man-filled concrete dugout of the company commander, a nice front-line guy who spent his time drinking a bottle of schnapps and a huge can of corned beef. From time to time he took a break from this occupation and, shaking his head, listened to the increasing artillery fire. Then he began to recall with a sigh the wonderful times he had spent in Russia and went on cursing about his utterly exhausted regiment. At last my eyes closed. Sleep was heavy and restless. The high explosive shells falling in the impenetrable darkness around the house caused an inexpressible feeling of loneliness and desolation in the dead landscape. I involuntarily moved toward the man lying on the bunk next. Suddenly I was thrown up by a violent jolt. My men lit up the walls to see if they were pierced. It turned out that a light shell had cracked the outer wall. I spent the entire second half of the next day with the battalion commander in his hideout, as I had several other important matters to find out. Six-inch shells exploded incessantly around the command post, while the rotmistra and his adjutant and commissioned officer played an endless game of scat, passing each other a seltzer bottle full of vile moonshine. Occasionally he would drop his cards to give an errand to a liaison officer, or with a concerned look he would strike up a conversation about the reliability of our shelter. In spite of strenuous objections, we assured him that we were beyond the reach of the shell from above. On the 25th at 8 o'clock, we were already evacuated from the barracks. One of them, opposite ours, was hit directly for the second time. Other shells, which fell on the rain-wet meadows, did not make much noise, but left deep craters. Wise from the previous day's experience, I found a lone, trustworthy crater in a large cabbage field behind the command post. I left it only after waiting for the necessary pause for safety. On this day, I received the very distressing news of the death of Lieutenant Brecht, who had died to the right of Nordhoff in the discharge of his duties as Divisional Observer Officer. He was one of the few men to whom the unfailing recklessness, even in this war of technology, gave a special charm. Men like him could be recognized in any crowd. They laughed when a new order of attack came. At such notices of death, one could not help thinking that you yourself would not last long. The morning hours of the 26th, were filled with hurricane fire of incredible force. Our artillery, in response to the barrage signals soaring upward, also redoubled its fury. Every patch of woodland and every hedge was packed with guns manned by half-deaf cannoneers. As the returning wounded gave vague and exaggerated accounts of the English attack, I and four others of my company were sent to the front line at eleven o'clock to make an accurate reconnaissance. We were making our way through the heaviest fire. Toward us were numerous wounded among them. Lieutenant Spitz, commander of the 12th, wounded in the knee, 
Already in front of the adit of the commander of the combat troops, we came under targeted mortar fire, which was a sign that the enemy had cut into our position. This suspicion was confirmed to me by Major Diet Lee-In, commander of the 3rd Battalion. I caught this elderly gentleman just as he was climbing out of his three-quarters flooded dugout and fishing out of the slush a foam pipe that had fallen there. The enemy had penetrated the front line and occupied a hill from which he could fire on the important valley of the Puddlebark, where the commander of the fighting troops was stationed. Marking this change of situation with a red pencil on the map, I set out with my men on the long march across the swamp. In a mad rush we jumped from one bump to another, and then moved more slowly towards Nordhoff. To the right and left shells slammed into the swamp, and threw up huge mountains of swamp mud accompanied by clouds of shrapnel. The Nordhoff was being shelled by landfills, and we had to traverse it by leaps and bounds. These things did burst with particular malice and a deafening crackle. They approached in groups at small intervals. Each time it was necessary to quickly jump over another piece of terrain and then wait in the funnel for the next blows. In the brief intervals between the first distant howl and the close explosion, the will to live became especially painful, as the body had only to wait helplessly and submissively for its fate. Shrapnel was added to the heavy shells. One such burst discharged a series of clapping volleys between us. One of my companions was hit by shrapnel on the back of his helmet and fell to the ground. After losing consciousness for a while, he got up and ran on. The area around Nortov was covered with a lot of mutilated corpses. As we were very diligent in our observation service, we often looked into places that had been inaccessible before. Thus, we were able to see what was forbidden on the battlefield. Everywhere we encountered death. It seemed that there was not a single living soul in this desert. In one place, behind a torn hedge, lay a group of bodies covered with the fresh earth that had covered them after the explosion. In another, near a crater, from which the noxious odour of the gases left by the explosion was still streaming, lay two liaisons prostrate. Many corpses were scattered over the small surface. A team of loaders caught in the centre of the fire vortex, or a lost reserve platoon that had found its end here. We would appear here, take one look at the mysteries of this corner of death, and disappear into the smoke again. Having safely overcome the heavily shelled space behind Paschendale Vestrozebeke Street, I reported to the regimental commander. The next morning at six o'clock, having received a task to determine whether and where the regiment could contact other units, I was sent to the front line. On the way I met Field Fleet Furchland. He was carrying orders to the 8th Company to move on Goodberg and close the gap, if any, between us and the neighbouring regiment on the left. After a long search we found the commander of the 8th, my friend Lieutenant Tebby, in an uninhabited part of the crater-strewn terrain, not far from the communication tower. The task of making such a conspicuous movement in broad daylight did not cause him much joy. During this little talk, constrained by the untold boredom of the morning white, cratered field, while waiting for the whole company to assemble, we smoked a cigar each. After walking a few paces we came under the aiming fire of infantry coming from the heights opposite each other, and had to run one by one from funnel to funnel. As we crossed the next slope, the fire became so dense that Tebby decided to take advantage of the cover of night to wait it out in the craters. Smoking a cigar with the greatest equanimity he went around the whole section, assigning men to squads. I began to move forward to determine the size of the breach, and for a moment lingered at the Tebbo funnel. The enemy's artillery, as punishment for the bold crossing, immediately began shelling this lane, a fragment of shell which struck the edge of our shelter and threw clay on the map and my eyes forced me up. I said goodbye to Tebe and wished him luck in the hours to come. Following he shouted, Lord help me to live tonight and morning will come as it is. We moved cautiously through the proven valley of Padabar, hiding behind clumps of shelled black poplars and using their trunks as bridges. Every now and then someone would fall hip deep into the swamp and, had it not been for the rifle butts my comrades held out, would surely have drowned. As a landmark, I chose a group of men standing around a concreted dugout. Ahead, in the same direction, four orderlies were dragging stretchers, puzzled by this observation, that a wounded man was being carried to the front line. I looked through my binoculars and saw a number of figures in khaki and flat helmets. At that moment, the first shots crackled. Since there was nowhere to take cover, we rushed back as the shells spat around us into the swamp mud. The race through the swamp was exhausting to the highest degree, but after running around as targets and being completely exhausted, we regained our former vigour 
and got a good load of fragmentation charges. At least, enveloped in the chad, they hid us from sight. The most unpleasant thing in this race was the prospect of being immediately turned into a swamp corpse because of the slightest wound. The bloody rivulets running down the craters made it clear that more than one man was lost here. Mortally exhausted, we reached the regiment's fighting position, where I gave my notes and reported on the situation. On October 28, we were again replaced by the Bavarian Reserve 10th Regiment, and constantly ready for an attack. We stationed ourselves in villages behind the front line. Headquarters went to most. In the evening, in fine spirits, we again sat in the premises of an abandoned tavern and celebrated the promotion and engagement of Lieutenant Zern, who had just returned from leave, as punishment for our levity. The next morning we were awakened by a hurricane fire of monstrous force, which, in spite of its remoteness, knocked out my window panes. An alarm was at once sounded, a rumour passed as if the enemy, taking advantage of a still unclosed gap, had penetrated into the space to the left of the regimental position. I spent the day waiting for orders at the observation post of the army's main command, the area around which was under a weak scattered fire. A light shell flew into a barrack window, and three wounded artillerymen sprang out of it, showered with brick flour. The other three, already dead, lay under the ruins. The next morning I received the following combat assignment from the Bavarian command. Due to the repeated advance of the enemy, the regiment's position on the left flank has been further pushed back, and the gap between both regiments has widened considerably. As the position was in danger of being bypassed on the left, the 73rd Rifle Regiment launched a counter-attack last night, but by all accounts was dispersed by barrage fire and did not reach the enemy. A second battalion was sent out this morning to close the gap. Still no news. Make a reconnaissance of the positions of the 1st and 2nd Battalion, I set off and already at Nordhoff I met Captain Brixen, commander of the 2nd Battalion, with a blueprint of the position in his pocket. I drew the drawing and thereby, in fact, completed my task, but still went to the concrete block of the commander of the combat troops to make sure of what was happening personally. There were many fresh corpses lying on the road, their pale faces staring motionless out of water-filled craters or so covered with swamp sludge that human features were barely visible. Unfortunately, the blue Gibraltar ribbon glistened on the sleeves of most of them. The commander of the combat troops was a Bavarian Captain Radelmeyer. This very active officer gave me the details of what Captain Brixen had given me a cursory account of. Our 2nd Battalion had suffered heavy losses. Among others, the battalion adjutant and the commander of the brave 7th Company were killed. The adjutant, named Lemier, was the brother of the commander of the 8th Company, who had fallen at Fresnoy in April. Both brothers were citizens of Liechtenstein and had joined the German army as volunteers, and both were killed in a strangely identical manner, shot in the... The captain called our attention to a concrete block 200 metres from ours, which had been defended particularly stubbornly yesterday. Soon after the attack, the commandant of the small fort, a field officer, noticed an Englishman taking three Germans away with him, meticulously knocking out the Englishman, he reinforced his command with three more men. When they ran out of ammunition, they placed the securely bound Englishman in front of the door as a peace sign, but stealthily withdrew from the position as darkness fell. Another concrete shelter, commanded by a lieutenant, was demanded by an English officer to be surrendered unconditionally. Instead of answering, a German sprang out of it, seized the Englishman, and dragged him inside before the eyes of the dazed soldiers. On the same day, I saw small detachments of orderlies, with flags raised moving openly in the infantry fire zone without receiving a single shot. Such were the pictures open to the eye of a fighter in this underground warfare, only if the need went to extremes. My return journey was made more difficult by the irritating gas of the British shells with the foul odour of rotten apples, which soaked the ground and brought tears to my eyes. After reporting for duty, at the dressing station I encountered a stretcher carrying two badly wounded officers, my buddies. One of them turned out to be Lieutenant Zern, only two days ago we had cheerfully honoured him, and there he lay, half undressed, with that yellowish waxen complexion which is a sure sign of death, on the hinge door looking at me glazed when I came to shake hands with him. Another, Lieutenant Haverkamp, had had the bones in his arms and legs shattered by shrapnel so that he must have had to have them amputated. With a dead, pale and petrified face, he lay on his stretcher and smoked one cigarette after another, the stretcher-bearers lighting and putting them into his mouth at his request. 
In these days, we again noted the appalling casualties among the young officers. This second battle in Flanders was monotonous. It was fought in viscous, marshy terrain, but it presented us with a great score. On November 3, at the station of Gitz, already known from our first days in Flanders, we were loaded into a train. The two Flemish women were evidently no longer distinguished by their former freshness. It seemed that they too had had their great battles in the meantime. For a few days we stopped at Torkering, a prominent town, the twin of Lille For the first and last time during the war the soldiers of the Seventh Company slept on a feather bed. I lodged in a sumptuously furnished room in the house of an industrial baron on the Rue de Lille. Comfortably seated in an armchair, I spent the first evening by the light of the indispensable marble fireplace. These few restful days were spent in indulging in the hard-won pleasures of life. We could not believe we had escaped death. We forced ourselves to enjoy all the forms of life we had found, in order to be convinced of its reality. After a considerable time, two more of my party appeared. A non-commissioned officer, Duzifkin, and a rifleman, Haller, who brought me at least some comfort. While wandering in the trenches, he came to a remote dead end and found three abandoned machine guns one of which he unscrewed from its stand and brought with him. As it became quite light, we hurried across the neutral ground to our front line. To the fourteen men who had gone out with me, only four returned. In Kinitz's patrol the losses were also heavy. My depression was somewhat relieved by the words of the glorious Oldenburger Duesifkin. While my arm was being bandaged in the adit, he recounted the events to his comrades standing at the entrance and ended with the following. Lieutenant Junger, what a man! You should have seen how he flew ahead of us into the barriers. Finally, almost all of us with bandaged heads and hands, we moved through the woods to the regimental command post. Colonel von Oppen greeted us and told us to drink coffee. He was quite distressed at our failure, but expressed his appreciation to us. Then I was put in the car and taken to the division to give a detailed report. The indiscriminate explosions of grenades still rattled in my ears, but I experienced the full bliss of leaning back and rushing down a country road. The officer of the general staff of the division received me in his office. He was rather acrimonious. I could tell from his irritation that he was trying to make me responsible for the failure of the action. When he jabbed his finger at the map and asked a question something like, why didn't you turn right in this passageway? I realized that chaos with no concept of left or right anymore was a thing beyond his comprehension. For him, it was all a plan. For me, it was a passionately experienced reality. The division commander met me very kindly and dispelled my bad mood soon. At lunch, I, in a crumpled tunic and with a bandaged hand, sat next to him and after his words. Only scoundrels are modest. I endeavoured to put the events of the morning in their true light. The next day, Colonel von Oppen again inspected the patrol. He distributed the iron crosses and gave each member fourteen days' leave. By evening the bodies of the fallen, which they had managed to get back, were buried in the soldiers' cemetery at Tiokur. Next to the casualties of that war, the soldiers of 1870-71 were also buried there. One of these old graves was adorned with a mossy stone with the inscription, Away from the eye but forever in the heart, on a large stone slab was carved. The sad row of graves grows, but the deeds of heroes multiply, let the Reach's glory live in them, its second birth. In the evening I read in the army reports of the French. The German action at Reneville failed. We took prisoners. The fact that it was more like wolves lost in a sheepfold was, of course, not mentioned. A few months later I received a letter from one of the missing, a rifleman named Meyer, who had lost a leg in a grenade fight there. After much wandering, he and his three comrades were forced into battle and severely wounded. He was taken prisoner when the others, among them non-commissioned officer Klopman, had already been killed. Klopman really belonged to those men who cannot be imagined captured. During the war I experienced all sorts of things, but none more bitter. It is still hard for me to remember our wandering through the trenches in the cold morning light. They were laden with an age-old animosity such as had never been felt in the English trenches, and by which it was at once clear what the difference between enemy and enemy was. A few days later, Lieutenants Dubaya and Zern and their men, after a series of shrapnel shots, jumped into the first line of the French. Domaya came upon a French defender with an oaky beard, who, at his cry of rendezvous, replied fiercely, Ah, pop! and rushed upon him in a fierce fight. Domaya shot the Frenchman in the neck with his pistol, and returned, as I did, without a prisoner. 
except that so many artillery shells were shot in our action that in 1870 there would have been enough for a whole battle. On the same day that I returned from leave, we were replaced by Bavarian units and were stationed in the nearby village of Labri, a typical backwater in those parts. On October 17, 1917, we relocated and a few days later we set foot again on the land of Flanders, which we had left two months before. After spending the night in the town of Isim, we set out the next morning for Ruler or Rauslair in Flemish. The town was in the early stages of destruction. The stores were still selling goods, but the inhabitants were already huddled in cellars, and the bonds of burger life had been broken by frequent shelling. Shop window with ladies' hats opposite my apartment gave me an impression of sinister nonsense amidst the bustle of war. At night, looters tried to break into the dwellings left behind. In the apartment located on Austriat, I was the only tenant occupying the ground rooms. The house belonged to a cloth merchant who had fled at the beginning of the war and left an old housekeeper and her daughter to guard the house. Both cared for a little orphan girl they had picked up during our advance. She had been abandoned by her parents and wandered the streets lost. They knew nothing about her, not her name or her age. The ladies were panic-stricken with fear of bombs, and almost on their knees they begged me not to turn on the lights upstairs lest they attract those damned pilots. I was not laughing either as I stood at the window next to Lieutenant Reinhardt and watched the Englishman glide across the rooftops in the searchlight, and as a huge bomb exploded near the house, sending shards of broken windows flying around our heads, tossed by the air wave. For the coming battles I was assigned as observation officer and placed at the disposal of regimental headquarters. I went to the command and observation post of the 10th Bavarian Reserve Regiment to receive instructions before the fighting began. In the face of the commander, I found a very friendly gentleman, although at the first acquaintance he grumbled something about my red cartouche, which did not correspond to the statute and should have been covered with grey cloth to avoid stray shots in the head. Two liaisons took me to the so-called liaison tower, from which I had a good view. As soon as we left the command and observation post, a burst shell blew up a layer of meadow earth, but in an area camouflaged by many small poplar groves. My superiors deftly dodged the fire, which by noon had developed into a continuous rumbling shaft. They acted with the instinct of old warriors, who even in the densest fire will find any reliable path among any landscape. On the doorstep of a lonely homestead, with traces of recent bursts, we saw a dead man lying flat on the ground. Bad luck to the poor fellow, sympathised the complacent Bayer. Air, said the other, ginger looking around and strode quickly onward. The liaison tower on the other side of the densely shelled Paschendale Westrabeek street proved to be a reporting station like the one I had commanded at Fresnois. It was near a house which had been reduced to a heap of rubble by the shelling and was so bare that it would not have been left a trace of it at the first accurate hit. From the three officers, who were amicably ecking out their cave-like existence here and who were extremely glad to be changed soon, I learned all I needed to know about the enemy, the position, and the approach roads, and then went back again through Rod Cruy's Osnierkirke to Ruler, where I reported everything to the colonel. Walking through the streets of the town, I studied with pleasure the cosy names of numerous inns, testifying to a truly Flemish domesticity. Who has not been attracted by signs with such names as Desalm, LD, Reaper Desalm, De Reap, De Nierwe Trumpet, De Dry Koningen, or Den Oliphant? The succinct and unspoiled language with which you are greeted, while saying you in confidence, already creates a cosy atmosphere. May God help this splendid country, which has so often been the scene of war, to heal from its present wounds and be reborn in its former nature. In the evening the city was bombed again. I went down into the cellar, where the women, trembling with fear, were huddled in a corner and lighted a pocket lantern to soothe the crying little girl, for the explosion had put out the light. Here again, I had an opportunity to see how firmly a man grows attached to his native soil. In spite of the greatest fear of danger, both women clung to that scrap of earth which every moment could become their grave. On the morning of October 22-2, I went with my observation detachment of four men to Calvit, where a change of regimental headquarters to take place before dinner. A heavy fire was raging at the front, and its flashes gave the early mist the appearance of boiling blood-red at the entrance to Osnikirke, a house collapsed near us, hit by a heavy shell. The stone debris rolled down the street with a rumbling sound. We tried to go around the place, but went straight ahead, as we did not know the direction to Rod Cruy's Calve. 
on the way I inquired for him from an unfamiliar non-commissioned officer standing at the entrance to the cellar. Instead of answering, he put both hands in his pockets and shrugged his shoulders. Since it was impossible to hesitate under fire, I jumped up to this failed product of military education and got information by shoving a pistol under his nose. For the first time during the war, I met a man who was complicating the situation not out of cowardice, but clearly out of reluctance. Although this reluctance has taken on an increasing scale in recent years, such an act during combat was clearly unusual, for battle binds and inaction dissipates. In battle one follows the dictates of necessity. By contrast, on the march, in the ranks of columns returning from a war of equipment, the breakdown of military discipline is seen most acutely. At Rodkeries itself, a small hamlet at a fork in the road, things took a serious turn. Artillery sleds were rushing through a shelled street, on either side of which infantry units were stretching out, winding through the terrain, and countless wounded were being dragged from the front line to the rear. We met a young artilleryman. A long, jagged piece of shrapnel, like the broken point of a spear, protruded from his shoulder. Turning from the street to the right, we moved toward the regimental command post, surrounded by a ring of heavy fire. Nearby two telephone operators were winding up a cable in a cabbage field. A shell burst near one of them. We saw the man collapse to the ground and thought him dead. Nevertheless, he got up again and continued to pull his cable with respectable equanimity. Since the command post consisted of one tiny concrete block and could barely fit the commander with his adjutant and a commissioned officer, I had to seek shelter somewhere nearby. Together with the liaison chemical and mortar officers, I settled in a light wooden barrack, which was far from being a model of safe shelter. In the afternoon I went to the position, for it was reported that the enemy had attacked the 5th Company in the morning. My path led through the communication tower to Nordhoff, a ruined farmhouse beyond recognition. Beneath its ruins dwelt the battalion commander on duty. From there a barely marked path led to the commander of the combat troops. The recent heavy rains had turned the immense field, riddled with craters, into a swamp, the depth of which was especially dangerous in the valley of the Paderbach. As I wandered, I sometimes came upon the lonely, forgotten dead, often a head or a hand sticking out of the mud above the edges of the craters. Thousands rest in this way and no friendly hand is found to place a tombstone on their limpid graves. After crossing the Paderbach with great difficulty, which could only be done by means of poplar trees thrown across it by shells, I found the commander of the 5th Company, Lieutenant Hines, in a huge crater among a small handful of loyal men. The position was on a slope and, being not completely flooded, might have been regarded by unpretentious front-line soldiers as habitable. Hines told me that a detachment of British riflemen had appeared in the morning and, met by bullets, had immediately disappeared. Still, he managed to shoot a few stragglers from the 164th, who had rushed to escape at its approach. Otherwise, all was in order. I then returned to the command post where I reported everything to the colonel. The next day our dinner was rudely interrupted by shells, which fell just outside the wooden wall. The fountains of mud they raised drummed on the tolled roof. Everyone rushed outside. I scurried away to a nearby homestead and, escaping the rain, went inside the house. In the evening it happened again. Only this time I stopped in front of the house because the rain had stopped. The next shell hit right into the building and it immediately collapsed. So in war chance decides everything. The law of small causes. Great consequences has more force here than anywhere else. Everything depends on seconds and millimetres. My adit was deep and damp. One feature it gave me little joy. It was here that some more mobile population of lice was present instead of the usual lice. Probably the two species are on hostile terms with each other, like stray rats and house rats. Even the usual change of linen did not help here, for the nimble vermin lurked insidiously in the straw of the bedstead. The desperate sleeper would eventually throw off the blanket and go on a real hunt. The food also left much to be desired. In addition to liquid soup, there was a scrap of bread with a ridiculously small supplement, most often half-spoiled jam. Half of it was eaten by a fat rat which I hunted for in vain. It's the companies a reserve and resting. We're located in deeply hidden forest settlements, consisting of elementary blockhouses. I especially liked my apartment at the reserve position in a blind corner on the slope of a narrow forest ravine. I lived there in a tiny half-burrowed hut, overgrown with hazel and wild cherry trees.
Through the window I could see the forested opposite mountainside and a narrow stream-swept strip of meadow at the bottom of the gorge. I amused myself here by feeding the crustacean spiders that hung their immense nets on the bushes. The bottles of all sorts on the back wall of the blockhouse testified to the fact that more than one hermit had spent a cosy time here. I too tried not to neglect a custom worthy of this place. As the evening mist mingled with the heavy white smoke of my fire and rose from the bottom of the gorge, and I squatted at the open door in the early twilight between the coolness of the autumn air and the heat of the fire. Only one drink seemed appropriate, a red wine mixed with egg liquor in a pint glass. These quiet feasts were a comfort to me also in the fact that my company was under the command of a man who had come from the reserve battalion. He was older than me by seniority. I, as platoon leader, was again doing boring trench duty. By old habit I tried instead of endless posts to get by with patrolling. On August 24, the brave Mr. Beckelman was wounded by a shell fragment. He was the third battalion commander whom the regiment had lost during the last few days. During my service in the trenches I became friendly with non-commissioned officer Kloppen, a man of advanced years and a married man, who was distinguished for his unusual fighting spirit. He was one of those men for whom it can be said that their courage is unshakable in the slightest degree, and that they are one in many hundreds. We thought it would be a good idea to look into the trenches of the French, and on August 29th paid our first visit to them. We crawled toward a gap in the enemy's wire fences, made in advance by Klopman during the night. To our unpleasant surprise, the breach was patched. Nevertheless, we cut the wire again with considerable noise and descended into the trench. After waiting for quite a while behind the nearest crossbar, we crawled along the telephone wire which ended at a bayonet stuck in the ground. The position, barred several times by wire, and in one place by a grill, was empty. After carefully examining everything, we returned the same way back and carefully sealed up the gap to conceal our visit. The next evening Klopman again examined the place, but was met by shots and hand grenades, so-called duck eggs, one of which fell near his head, which was pressed into the ground, but did not explode. We had to run away immediately. The next night we went in together. There were men in the front trench of the enemy. We tracked down four of the posts and established their places. One of them was whistling a lovely tune to himself. Finally they opened fire on us, and we crawled back. When I was alone in the trench again, my comrades Voigt and Haferkamp suddenly appeared, obviously tipsy. They were seized with the strange idea of leaving the cosy camp and sneaking through the dark woods to the front line to, as they said, go on patrol. I have always adhered to the principle that everyone knows best where to risk his head, and though the enemy had not yet calmed down, I did not interfere with them. Their whole outing, however, consisted in looking for silk parachutes from French rockets and waving these white rags, chasing each other in front of the enemy's barrier. They were naturally shot at. After a while, they returned safely. Bacchus kept them in his infinite favor. On September 10, I went from the reserve camp to the regimental combat headquarters to ask for leave. I was just thinking of you. Turn to me, Colonel von Oppen. The regiment needs to conduct a reconnaissance by combat. I intend to entrust it to you. Find the right men and practice with them in Suleva camp. We were to penetrate enemy trenches in two places and try to take prisoners. The patrol was divided into three parts. Two strike teams and a guard to take the first line to cover us from the back. Besides the general command, I took charge of the left group, the right group I assigned to Lieutenant Kinnitz. When I called for volunteers, to my surprise. After all, it was already 1917. Nearly three quarters of the battalion's personnel came forward from all the companies. I selected the participants according to my old habit. I walked along the front looking for good faces. Some of that majority I sent back almost cried. My squad, including myself, consisted of 14 men, among them Warrant Officer von Zieglinicki, non-commissioned Officer Klopman, non-commissioned Officer Mevius, non-commissioned Officer Duesken, and two sappers. Here the most desperate heads of the 2nd Battalion came together. For ten consecutive days we practiced grenade throwing, rehearsing our plan on a similar assault site to the actual assault. It's a miracle that with such zeal back then only three of my men were injured by shrapnel. We did nothing else. So by the evening of September 22 I, at the head of a feral but combat-ready gang, moved to the second position where we were ordered to camp for the night. In the evening Kinnitz and I walked through the dark woods to the battalion command post, 
where Mr. Schumacher invited us to the last supper of the suicide bomber. Then we lay down in our adit to rest for a few more hours. It is a marvellous feeling when you know that tomorrow you must endure a fight not for life, but for death, and you listen to yourself before falling asleep. At three o'clock we were awakened, got up, washed up and told to carry breakfast. Immediately I was angry. My soldier had salted the scrambled eggs which I was going to eat in honour of such a day. We pushed our plates away and talked for the thousandth time about everything that might happen. In addition to this, we mutually helped ourselves to sherry brandy while Kinnitz told ancient anecdotes. Without twenty minutes to five, we rounded up the men and led them to the bunker for the duty squad on the front line. Gaps had already been made in the wire fences, and lime-laden arrows pointed in the direction of the attack points. We shook hands and looked forward to what was to come. For the bloody work for which we had been preparing for so long, I was suitably equipped. Two bags with four hand grenades on the chest, a primer on the left, a powder tube on the right, an eight pistol in a holster on a long belt, a mauser in the right pocket of my uniform, five lemonade pistols in the left pocket of my uniform, a luminous compass and a signal whistle in the left pocket of my pants, a carbine lock for breaking the ring, a dagger and wire cutting scissors at the portcullis. In the inner breast pocket was a puffy wallet and my letter home. In the back pocket of the uniform was a flat flask of sherry brandy. The epaulettes and the Gibraltar ribbon we had removed so that the enemy could not determine our identity. Each had a white armband on his sleeve as an identifying mark. Without four minutes to five from the left neighbouring division opened diversionary fire. At exactly five o'clock the sky behind our front flashed and tracer bullets whistled over our heads. I stood with Klopman at the entrance to the adit and smoked my last cigar. Because of the many short bursts of gunfire, it was better to stand in cover. With watch in hand, I counted down the minutes. At precisely five. Five, we rushed out of the adit outside to the intended roads through the barriers. I was rushing ahead, grenade high, and could see in the early twilight an assault patrol on the right. The enemy's barrier was weak. I swung over it in two leaps, but, tripping over a wire spiral stretched behind it, fell into a crater from which I was pulled by Klopman and Mevius. Go. We jumped into the first line, meeting no resistance, while a grenade fight broke out on the right. Ignoring it, we climbed over the sandbag barricade in front of the nearest trench and, jumping from funnel to funnel, reached the slingshots that separated us from the second line in two rows. As this, too, was completely broken and offered no hope of taking a prisoner, we hurried along the dugout passage farther on. I had once sent forward sappers to clear the way, but as I lacked pace all the time, I led them myself. And at the entrance to the third line, a discovery awaited us that took my breath away. The smouldering tip of a cigarette lying on the ground announced the close proximity of the enemy. I signalled to my men, clutched the grenade tighter, and crawled cautiously along the well-fortified trench, to the walls of which were leaning many rifles that had been left behind. In such situations, the consciousness notes every detail. Thus, as if in a dream, the sight of a pot with a spoon sticking out of it, forgotten at this place, was imprinted in my brain. It was this observation that twenty minutes later saved our lives. Suddenly the shadows of some figures slid in front of us. We rushed there and found ourselves at a dead end, in the wall of which was a ruined entrance to an adit. Throwing myself there, I shouted. Much of the grenade that came out was my answer. It was probably a remotely detonated shell. I heard a slight pop and jumped back. The shell exploded at head height against the opposite wall, tearing my silk cap to shreds. The shrapnel hit my left hand in several places and tore off the tip of my little finger. A non-commissioned officer of the sappers standing near me had his nose pierced. We retreated a few steps and pelted the danger spot with grenades. Someone too zealous threw an incendiary tube directly into the entrance, thus rendering further attack pointless. We returned and followed a third line in the opposite direction to finally capture the enemy. Abandoned weapons and pieces of equipment lay everywhere. The question as to where the owners of so many rifles had gone and where they lurked became more and more agonizing. And yet, with grenades at the ready and pistols unsecured, we hurried along the deserted, powder-smoke-covered trenches. How we managed to get out became clear to me only on later reflection. Unbeknownst to ourselves, we had turned into the third move, and, being under our own barrage, we approached the fourth line. From time to time we pulled out one of the crates built into the walls and pocketed a grenade as a memento. Having run through the labyrinth of trenches several times, we no longer realised where we were and in what direction the German positions lay. 
we became worried. The compass hands were dancing in our trembling hands, and when looking for the polar star, all the school wisdom suddenly went completely out of our heads. The sound of voices in the neighboring trench testified that the enemy, after the first confusion, was beginning to come to his senses. Soon they would realize our position. We went back again. I was the last to go as suddenly the barrel of a machine gun swung over a pile of sandbags in front of me. I jumped there, tripping over the corpse of a dead Frenchman, and saw non-commissioned officer Klopman and warrant officer von Zieglinicki fiddling with the weapon, while rifleman Hauler, with blood-stained hands, searched for papers on the dead man's torn body. Forgetful of our surroundings, we busied ourselves with the machine gun in a feverish haste to at least bring the trophy with us. I tried to loosen the retaining screws, Someone was using wire cutters to break off the machine gun belt. At last we grabbed the thing standing on a tripod and dragged it along without dismantling it. At that moment, from a parallel trench in the direction where we supposed our line to be, came an excited but menacing voice from the enemy QYCQYA, and a black ball, standing out vaguely in the dawn sky, flew at us in a high arc. Attention! Lightning flashed between Mavius and me, a shard embedded in his arm. We rushed sideways, getting more and more bogged down in the tangle of trenches. Beside me were only the non-commissioned officer of the sappers, whose nose was bleeding and mevia. Only the confusion of the French, who had not hitherto ventured out of their holes, was pushing back our doom. It could only be a matter of minutes before we ran into an outnumbered force that would be happy to finish us off. I was already contemplating whether I should not simply throw a grenade with a percussion fuse at the head of the first person I encountered. There was no hope of mercy. When I had given up all hope of getting out of this hornet's nest alive, I let out a cry of joy. My gaze fell on the pot and spoon, and I realized everything. Since it was already dawning, there was not a second to lose. To the whistle of enemy bullets, we jumped across the open ground to our lines. In the front trench of the French, we came upon a patrol of Lieutenant von Kinitz. When the password kid and mug was sounded towards us, we realized that the worst was over. Unfortunately, I jumped right on top of the seriously wounded man they had laid down here. Kinitz hastily told me that he had driven away the diggers of the first trench with a grenade, and, advancing thence to the beginning of it, had lost many men killed and wounded under the fire of his own artillery. On August 3, having abundantly stocked up on cattle and the fruits of the abandoned fields, we moved to the station of the nearby town of Gitz. In the station beer house, the whole so much reduced battalion again in excellent spirits drank coffee flavoured to everyone's delight, with very risky expressions of two strong Flemish Kelnishers. The soldiers especially liked the fact that they said to everyone, including the officers, according to the village custom. A few days later I received from the infirmary in Gelsenkirchen a letter from Fritz. He wrote that his arm would apparently remain immobile and his lung would remain sore. Further, I give an excerpt from his diary which will complete this message and vividly convey the impression of a newcomer thrown into the crucible of war, the war of technology. To the assault, Gaia ready. The platoon leader's face bent over the small cave. The three sitting next to him cut off the conversation and grumbling jumped up. I stood up, adjusted my helmet and stepped out into the gloom. It was foggy and cool. In the meantime, the picture had changed, the battle fire had ceased. Now it focused with a deafening hoosh on other parts of the gigantic battlefield. Airplanes furrowed the air, soothing the anxiously searching eye with the sight of a large iron cross painted on the underside of a wing. I visited the well again, which had miraculously remained clear among the ruins and debris, and filled my flask. As the company command was getting platooned, I quickly slipped four grenades into my harness and went to my squad, two of whom were not present. Hardly had time to write down their names before everything was in motion. In rows of one platoons moved across the battlefield, skirting the barns and clinging to the hedges, and with thunderous shouts rushed at the enemy. The attack was led by two battalions. A battalion of a neighbouring regiment was engaged with us. The order was laconic. English formations, approaching the canal, must be thrown back. It fell to my share to lie down with my detachment in the occupied positions and to repel a counterattack. We reached the ruins of the village. The black, splintered fragments of individual trees protruded from the mangled earth of Flanders, the remains of a large forest. Great puffs of smoke stretched above the ground, curtaining the evening sky with a heavy, gloomy canopy. The cold earth, again so mercilessly tormented, was enveloped in choking gases. Yellow and brown, 
they crawled sluggishly from place to place. Preparedness for anti-chemical defence was announced. At that moment a terrifying fire began. The attackers had been discovered by the British. The ground rose to the foothills with hissing fountains. A hail of splinters showered on the ground. For a moment then they scattered. Again I heard the voice of the battalion commander, Romistra Beckelman. He shouted some order, sucking hard. I never understood what it was. My command disappeared. I found myself in someone else's platoon, and with the others I made my way through the ruins of a village razed to the ground by relentless shells. We grabbed gas masks. Everyone threw themselves on the ground. To my left was Lieutenant Elat, kneeling on the ground, an officer familiar to me from the Battle of the Somme. Beside him lay a non-commissioned officer, gazing at his surroundings. The force of the barrage was terrible. I must confess that it exceeded my wildest expectations. A yellow wall of fire rippled in front of us. A rain of clods of earth, shards of tile and iron splinters flew at us from above, shooting bright sparks from our helmets. Even breathing seemed to be difficult now, as if there was not enough air for our lungs in this iron-saturated atmosphere. For a long time I looked into this boiling witch's cauldron, the visible boundaries of which were marked by the fire from the barrels of British machine guns. The countless bee swarms of these bullets pouring down upon us were inaudible to the ear. It was clear that our attack, prepared by such a powerful horror barrage, had been defeated at the outset. Twice at short intervals a monstrous rumble swallowed up the whole rampage. Shells of the largest caliber burst. The earth avalanche flew into the air and, twisting and stirring, came crashing back down with an infernal rumble. I turned to my right at the loud call of a screaming Eilat. He raised his left hand, waved to follow, and leaped forward. I struggled to get up and ran after him. My legs burned like fire, but the stabbing pain was gone. Hardly had I gone twenty paces and started to climb out of another crater when I was blinded by the cold light of shrapnel that exploded ten paces away, three meters above the ground. I felt two blunt blows in my chest and shoulder. I let go of my rifle, toppled backward and rolled backward into the crater. As if in a fog I heard the voice of Aiklet running past. My, this one's ready. He didn't live to see the next day. The attack failed and he was killed in the retreat, along with all the men who had accompanied him. A bullet, shooting through the back of his head, took the life of this brave officer. When I awoke from my long fainting spell, it was quieter. I tried to rise. As I lay with my head down, I felt a sharp pain in my shoulder, and at the slightest movement it increased. My breathing was intermittent. My lungs couldn't get enough air. It ricocheted into my lungs and shoulder, I thought, recalling how I had received two blunt, painless blows. I discarded the assault gear and the harness, and, in a state of utter indifference, the gas mask as well. I kept my helmet on, and hung my flask from a hook on the side of my uniform. I managed to get out of the funnel. But after five steps, with difficulty, I found myself in the next funnel. For a whole hour I tried to get out of it, as the field began to shudder again onto the hurricane fire, but even this attempt failed. I lost the flask filled with precious water and fell into a perfect oblivion, from which I was awakened some time later by a sensation of burning thirst. Quietly the rain began to fall. I managed to collect some muddy water with my helmet, I had lost all sense of direction and did not realize where the front line was. The craters, one larger than the other, followed each other, and from the bottom of them nothing could be seen but clay walls and grey sky. A thunderstorm was breaking, the thunderclaps drowned out by the renewed hurricane fire. I pressed myself against the wall of the funnel. Lumps of clay hit me on the shoulder, heavy splinters whizzed over my head. Gradually, I lost my sense of time. I did not know whether it was morning or evening. Once two men appeared, crossing the field in long leaps. I called out to them in German and English. They disappeared like shadows in the fog without hearing me. At last three men came toward me. In one of them I recognized the non-commissioned officer who had been with me the day before. They carried me to a small hut nearby. It was full of wounded men cared for by two orderlies. So I lay in the crater for thirteen hours. The powerful fire of the battle continued its work, as in a giant forge. The shells were hitting near us, showering the roof with sand and earth. I was bandaged up, given a gas mask, bred with hard red jelly and some water. The orderly took fatherly care of me. The first Englishman had already appeared ahead. They moved across the field in leaps and bounds and disappeared into the craters. Shouts and calls came from outside. Suddenly a young officer, 
covered from toe to helmet with clay, came. It was Ernst, my brother, who the day before had been listed as killed at regimental headquarters. We greeted each other, smiling dazedly and rapturously. He looked around and looked anxiously at me. Tears came to his eyes. Although we belonged to the same regiment, this meeting on the vast battlefield was a miracle, a shock. I always remembered it with awe. A few minutes later Ernst came out and brought with him five men from his company. All that was left of it. I was placed on a cloak tent, with the trunk of a young tree pulled through its cords, and carried from the battlefield. The stretcher bearers took turns of two at a time. The little procession looped from right to left, zigzagging between the bursting shells. Forced to find urgent shelter, they threw me several times, hitting me painfully on the bottom of the crater. Finally, we reached a concrete and iron-clad dugout with the outlandish name Columbus Egg. I was dragged down and laid on wooden bunks. Two unfamiliar officers sat silently in the room, listening to the hurricane concert of artillery. One was, as I later learned, Lieutenant Bartmer, the other a paramedic named Helms. I never felt more greedy for drink than for that mixture of rainwater and red wine which he poured into me. Immediately I was seized with fever, gasping for air. I tried to take a breath of air, and, as in a nightmare, I felt as if a concrete ceiling slab were on my chest, and I had to push it away with every breath. And heard entered the doctor's assistant, Keppen. Chased by shells, he ran across the battlefield. He recognized me, leaned over me, and I saw his face curve into a semblance of a reassuring smile. Behind him came my battalion commander. The stern man gave me a light pat on the shoulder, and I smiled, thinking that the Kaiser himself was coming in to check on my health. The four men sat down together, drank their mugs, and whispered. I noticed that for a moment they were talking about me. Scraps of conversation came to me, brother, slight, wounded. Then I tried to piece them together in my mind. The men started talking loudly about things on the battlefield. And then the deathly fatigue I was in was penetrated by a feeling of happiness. It grew more and more, and never left me in the weeks that followed. I thought of death, but that thought no longer bothered me. Everything became remarkably simple. Thinking you are all right, I sank into sleep. On July 4, 1917, we got off the train at the famous Mars Latour. The 7th and 8th companies were stationed at Doncourt, where we had a few blissful, peaceful days. Only the scanty rations made me a little uneasy. It was strictly forbidden to stock up on provisions in the fields. Yet almost every morning the village gendarmes brought me several men who had been caught at night digging potatoes. I could not avoid punishing them, because they were caught, as my not quite official argument went. It was also then that I learned that unjustly obtained wealth does not last. From one abandoned lord's estate, Tebby and I took a princely carriage with glass. We managed to keep it from envious eyes the whole way. We dreamed of a luxurious trip to Metz, to enjoy life to the fullest for once. One afternoon we harnessed the horses to the carriage and set off. Unfortunately, the carriage had no brakes. It was suitable for the plains of Flanders, but not for the mountainous land of Lorraine, already in the village. The horses were reeling, and we soon found ourselves in a state of frantic galloping that could have ended badly. The first to fall out was the coachman, then Tebby fell on a pile of farm implements and remained there lying motionless. I sat alone on the silk cushions and felt disgusted. The door swung open and was blown away by a telegraph pole. At last the carriage rolled down the steep slope and smashed to pieces against the wall of the house, leaving the ruined carriage through the window. I marvelled that I was unharmed. On July 9, the company was inspected by the division commander, Major General von Bass, who praised us for our excellent behaviour in battle. The next day, at noon, we were loaded and taken to Chokur. From there we marched at once to our new position, which stretched across the wooded heights of the Cotia Rain, opposite the burned village of Reneville, more than once mentioned in the orders for the unit. On the first morning I surveyed my station. It was an immense maze of partially collapsed trenches and seemed to me rather long for a company. The front line had also been destroyed in many places by the plunger mines used in this position. My adit was behind it about a hundred metres away, in what was called a communication trench, not far from the road leading out of Reneville. For the first time in a long time our positions lay against the French. The place had been made for geologists. The trenches exposed one after another six layers, from coral limestone to local marl. The yellow-brown rocky soil was littered with fossils, most notably the flat, 
spun like sea urchins that bordered the walls of the trenches by the thousands. Whenever I went around the site, I returned to the dugout with pockets full of shells, sea urchins, and ammonites. The marl also had its own pleasantness. It resisted the weather much better than the clay soil. In some places, the trench was even carefully lined with stone, and the bottom was concreted in long stretches so that rainwater could easily flow out. As we were a small handful, I tried to reinforce it with the abundance of men wandering nearby who were without commanders. Most of them heeded our calls at once, glad to have found their place at last, while others, having lost their composure completely, hesitated and seeing that nothing good awaited us, rushed on. But in such cases there was no time for tenderness. Ready to fire, I commanded my men who stood in front of me under cover of the house. Several shots were fired. As if mesmerized, looking into the muzzles of their rifles, these cowards, inevitable in every battle, slowly approached, though it was evident from their faces how reluctant they were to join our company. One of the officer's club messengers, well known to me who had tried to sneak away, I did not let him get away either. But I have no rifle. Wait till somebody gets killed? During the last particularly formidable fire attack, when shells hit the ruins of the house several times and shards of tile struck our helmets, I was suddenly thrown to the ground by a terrible blow. To the astonishment of my men, I rose unharmed. After this powerful final whirlwind, it became calmer. The fire had moved to the Langemark Bixhooth highway behind us, but we were not relieved. Until now, as they say, we had not seen the forest for the trees. The danger was so formidable and looming over us by so many enemies that we could do nothing about it. After the firestorm that swept over us, we had a brief respite to prepare for the inevitable, and its time had come. The rifle fire died down. Those sitting in defence were crushed. A thick chain of riflemen was visible in the smoke. My men answered, crouched behind the ruins, machine guns were firing. The attackers rapidly disappeared into the craters and surrounded us with fire. On the right and left, powerful squads were advancing. Soon we found ourselves surrounded by the enemy. The situation was hopeless. There was no point in sacrificing men. I gave the order to retreat. It was not easy to lead away people obsessed with the excitement of battle. Under cover of a long cloud of smoke lying in the stream, we had to retreat part way down the creek, the water in it up to our thighs. Although the ring around us was almost closed, we managed to slip out of it unnoticed. I was the last to leave the little fortress, supporting Lieutenant Hellerman, who was bleeding from a head wound, but joking about his helplessness. As we crossed the road, we came upon the second company. From the wounded, Caius had heard of our situation, and without any orders, not only on his own initiative, but at the insistence of his men, he came forward to repel us. This testimony to the reliability of a friend touched us, lifting our spirits. At such moments, fortitude miraculously comes alive and one wants to move mountains. After a short consultation, we decided to halt and attack the enemy. Here we also had to detain people from other formations who wanted to continue the withdrawal unauthorized, especially the artillerymen. Signers, 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 and other loners could only be dissuaded by force. In such circumstances, they also had to join the firing line with weapons in their hands, by persuasion, orders, and butt pokes. With the help of Caius and a few other reasonable men, I finally got the firing line established. Then we went down to our intended trench and had breakfast. Caius pulled out his invariable apparatus and took some pictures. To our left on the Langemark side there was a stirring. Our men fired at the loitering figures until I told them not. Following this, a non-commissioned officer appeared and reported that a company of guards' riflemen had entrenched near the road and that our fire had inflicted casualties on them. I gave orders, under a heavy gunfire, to advance to their height. Several men fell, and Lieutenant Bartmer of the second company was severely wounded. Nearby, finishing his sandwich as he went, was Cuse. As we took the road from which the terrain sloped down to the creek, we noticed that the British intended to do the same. Already the first khaki-clad figures could be seen within twenty yards of us. As far as the eye could see, the plain before us was filled with chains of riflemen and paired columns. They were swarming already at Rattenburg. We took advantage of the suddenness of our appearance and fired as hard as we could. At Stony Creek a whole line was killed. One of the riflemen had a reel on his back from which he was winding the wire. The others jumped about like hares while our bullets whipped up fountains of dust around them. One youthful-looking effret of the 8th Company laid his rifle quite coolly on a split stump and killed four of the enemy one by one. 
the others crawled into a shell crater, so that hiding there they could hold out until dusk. We made a clean sweep. About eleven o'clock British flagged planes came down over us, but were driven back by artillery fire from above. In the midst of this mad rumbling I still could not keep from smiling when a man informed me, and asked me to put it on record, that with a rifle shot he had hit an airplane. Immediately after we took the road I sent a report to the regiment and asked for reinforcements. In the afternoon platoons of infantry, sappers and machine guns came up. Following the tactics of old Fritz the front line was loaded to capacity. From time to time, the British shot down careless runners across the road. About four o'clock began a very unpleasant bombardment of shrapnel. Charges were thickly dumped on the road. It was clear to me that the pilots had already located our new line of resistance and that difficult hours awaited us. Indeed, a heavy bombardment of light and heavy shells soon began. We were lying tightly in a crowded straight as a ruler ditch. The fire danced before our eyes. Branches and clods of clay were falling on us. To the left, very close by, a fiery bolt of lightning flashed, leaving a white choking vapour. Bracing myself with elbows and toes, I crawled to my neighbour. He didn't move. Blood oozed from his numerous wounds, inflicted by the small jagged edges of the shrapnel. There were also heavy casualties on the right side. After half an hour it became quieter. We intensively dug deep holes in the flat excavation of the trench, in order to protect ourselves at least from the shrapnel in the event of a second raid. In doing so our shovels came across rifles, portcullises and shell casings dating back to 1914. Evidence that this was not the first time blood had been shed on this land? As dusk came on, we were again in deep thought. I sat next to Keats in a depression that had cost us a few blisters. The earth shook like a ship in a rocking motion, with continuous close bursts. We braced ourselves for the worst, pulling my helmet over my forehead and biting my pipe. I stared thoughtfully at the road where bouncing iron splinters were shooting sparks out of the rocks. I drew courage from my reflections, not without success. The strangest thoughts were passing through my mind. I was suddenly reminded of a cheap French novel, La Veiture de la Sierra which had come into my possession. Rita Sierra, which had fallen into my hands in Cambrai. Several times I mumbled the words of Arios, if death is glorious, a noble heart does not fear it whenever it comes. This sounds a little strange, inducing a pleasant feeling of intoxication similar to that approximately experienced on the so-called Ferris wheel. In the moments when the rumbling gave some rest to my ears, I heard fragments of a beautiful song about the black warrior who fell at Ascalon and I thought my friend Kius was a little crazy. However, everyone calms himself in his own way. At the end of the shelling, a large piece of shrapnel lightly grazed my arm. Kius shined his pocket flashlight. We saw only a scratch. After midnight, it began to rain. Patrols of the regiment assembled in the meantime reached Stony Creek and found only mud-filled craters. The enemy had withdrawn behind the creek. Exhausted by the incredible exertion of the day, we all, except the sentries, settled down in our holes. I covered my head with the tattered overcoat of my dead neighbour and fell into a restless sleep. At dawn I awoke to the sensation of something cold and saw that I was in a deplorable condition. It was pouring like a bucket. From the gutter of the road was flowing to the bottom of my hole. I made a small dam and scooped the water out of my hiding place with the lid of a kettle. As the water level in the gutter rose, I kept building up my structure until at last it swayed under the weight of the growing weight and the mud filled my hole to the top. As I struggled to get my gun and helmet out of the mud, tobacco and bread floated along the ditch, the other occupants of which were in the same position, shivering and freezing, without a dry thread on our bodies. We stood there, conscious that the first shelling would catch us without any shelter in the midst of the road mud. It was a terrible morning. I noticed then that no artillery fire can so deprive a man of the power of resistance as cold and damp. Later, however, it turned out that this prolonged rain was truly a gift of God to us, for because of it the British advance was halted during these first crucial days. The enemy's artillery had to traverse a swampy, funnel-covered area while we brought up ammunition on an undisturbed road. At 11 a.m., when we were in despair, a redeeming angel appeared in the form of a liaison and brought orders that the regiment should assemble at Koki. On the return march we saw how difficult it was to keep in touch with the front line on the day of the offensive. The streets were crowded with men and horses. Near several guns with their foreparts pierced like iron rubbers, twelve terribly mangled horses stood blocking the road. 
In the drenched meadow, over which clouds of milky white shrapnel hung in some places, the remnants of the regiment were gathered. We were shocked at the sight of the wretched heap all that remained of the company, among which the officers stood in a group. What a loss! Of the two battalions nearly all the officers and crew, the survivors, frowning, stood in the pouring rain waiting for the quartermasters. In a wooden barrack we dried off, huddled around a blazing stove, and at a dense breakfast we regained the will to live. Human nature is irresistible. Toward evening shells were pounding the village. A bomb hit one of the barracks and killed several men from the third company. In spite of the shelling, we soon settled down with the only hope that in this rain we would not be thrown into either counterattack or defence. Since at 3 a.m., the order to retreat came. We moved along the Staten Road, strewn with corpses and burned-out vehicles. As far as the eye could see, fire raged everywhere. We saw the crater of a single explosion surrounded by twelve dead. Staten, so lively when we first arrived, showed us a multitude of charred houses. The deserted market square was strewn with broken household goods. A family leaving the town was pulling a cow, the only remaining possession. They were simple people. The husband waddled on a prosthetic lime. The wife held a crying child in her arms. An indistinct rumble behind them made the picture even sadder. The surviving remnant of the second battalion was stationed in a lonely courtyard nestled among lush, expansive fields behind a dense hedge. There I was given command of the seventh company, with which I was to share sorrow and joy for the rest of the war. In the evening we sat in front of the old tiled fireplace, drinking strong grog and listening to the resurgent hum of battle. Looking through the latest issue of the newspaper, among the front reports I noticed the following phrase. We have succeeded in holding off the enemy on the Stony Brook line. It was strange to learn that our confused actions that Dark Knight had taken on a world historical meaning. We had contributed in no small measure to bring the onslaught of powerful forces that had been launched to a halt. No matter how great were the human and material resources put into action, the decisive work in the right places was done by a very small number of warriors. Soon we went to rest in the hayloft. In spite of a sufficient quantity of liquor, most of the sleepers were delirious and rushing about in their sleep, reliving anew all the vicissitudes of the battle in Flanders. In the evening the fire raged with furious force everywhere. Colourful flares soared before us in a ceaseless succession. Dusty liaisons reported that the enemy was advancing. After a week of hurricane fire, the infantry went into a we arrived just in time. Back at the point to the company commander, I waited for the arrival of the second company, which appeared at four o'clock in the morning at the height of the fire raid. I took my platoon and led it to the place indicated to us. To a concrete structure covered by the ruins of a destroyed house, inexpressibly lonely lying in the middle of the eerie desolation of a huge, riddled with craters battlefield. At six o'clock in the morning the dense Flanders fog lighted up, revealing to our gaze a horrifying view of the surrounding countryside. Then, hovering densely overhead, a squadron of enemy pilots appeared. Signaling with sirens, he surveyed the rugged terrain, while the infantrymen scattered by the explosions across the field hid in shell craters. Half an hour later a terrible fire attack began, immediately turning our shelter into a small island in the middle of a sea of raging fire. The forest of bursts around us condensed into a moving wall. We huddled together and waited every moment for a shell to fall, which would sweep us away without a trace, along with our concrete shelter, and flatten us into a crater-riddled wasteland. Amid such barrages of fire, when we could only pause to catch our breath, the whole day passed. In the evening appeared to the extreme exhausted liaison and handed me the order, from which I learned that the first, third and fourth companies at ten. Fifteen go to counterattack. The second should assemble and wait for replacements, to conserve my strength for the coming hours. I went to bed, not realising that my brother Fritz, who I knew was still in Hanover, was rushing to the assault through the firestorm with a detachment of the third company just past my hiding place. My sleep was disturbed by the groans of a wounded man laid by us by two Saxons, who had strayed into the field, immediately falling asleep in exhaustion. When they awoke next morning their comrade was dead. They carried him to the nearest hollow from the explosion, threw in a couple of handfuls of earth and departed, leaving behind them one of the countless lonely and ungraves of this war. Waking up only at eleven o'clock from a deep forgetfulness, having washed my helmet, I sent for orders to the company commander, but he, to my surprise, had already left without informing either me or Kiers's platoon. That's how it happens in war.
there are mishaps that one would never think of on manoeuvres. While I was sitting on my bunk, cursing everything and thinking what to do, the battalion liaison appeared and gave me the order to take command of the 8th Company immediately. I learned that last night the 1st Battalion's counterattack had failed with heavy losses and that its remnant had taken up a defensive position to the left and right of the nearest grove in the Dobskutsky forest. The 8th Company was to enter the grove for reinforcements, but was dispersed with heavy losses on the neutral strip by barrage fire. As its commander, Senior Lieutenant Budingen, was wounded, I had to lead the company forward again. Saying goodbye to my orphaned platoon, I set off with my liaison straight across the shrapnel-strewn desert. A voice full of despair stopped us as we ran, ducking. In the distance, a figure half out of a crater waved at us with a bloody stump of an arm, pointing toward the shelter we had just left. We rushed on. The eighth company appeared before me as a handful of fallen men hiding behind concrete dugouts. Mattoon men. Three non-commissioned officers appeared, declaring a repeated advance to the Dobshutsky forest impossible. In fact, powerful ruptures stood in front of us a wall of fire. I ordered the platoons to assemble behind three dugouts, each with approximately fifteen to twenty men. Suddenly the fire fell upon us. The resulting confusion is hard to describe. At the left dugout a whole group of men flew into the air, while the right dugout was hit directly. Its many tons of rubble buried Lieutenant Butingen, who was still lying there after being wounded. We were like a pestle into which a heavy pestle is continually being lowered. The men looked at each other with deadly pale faces, and the wounded screamed again and again. Perhaps it did not matter whether to stay here, whether to rush backward or forward. So I ordered them to follow me and jumped straight into the fire. After a couple of jumps, I was covered with earth from the shell and thrown back into the nearest crater. It means hard to explain why I wasn't hit. The bursts were so dense that they seemed to touch my helmet and shoulders. They scorched the ground like huge beasts with their hooves. The reason that I skipped through unscathed was probably that the repeatedly torn earth swallowed the shells deeply before its resistance made them explode, and the pyramids of bursts rose in vertical peaks rather than sprawling bushes. In addition, I soon noticed that the fury of the fire waned as I moved forward. When the worst was over, I looked around. There was not At last two men appeared out of the clouds of smoke and dust, then another, then two again. With these five I reached my target safely. In a ruined concrete shelter with three machine guns sat Lieutenant Zanfos, commander of the 3rd Company, and Little Schultz. I was greeted with a loud cheer and given a sip of brandy, then described my situation, which was little good. Directly in front of us were the British. There were none of our own on our right or left. It was clear to everyone that only tried and tested soldiers, graying in the powder smoke, were fit for this place. Suddenly Zanfos asked me if I'd heard anything about my brother. You can imagine my dismay when I learned that he had participated in the night assault and disappeared. He was the closest person to me. A sense of irreplaceable loss overwhelmed me. A man who appeared afterward informed me that my brother was wounded and lying in a dugout nearby. He pointed to an abandoned concrete structure covered with uprooted tree roots, already abandoned by the defenders. I rushed through the clearing lying under the aiming fire and entered it. What a date it was. My brother was lying in a cadaverous smelling room among many moaning wounded. He was in a serious condition. One had pierced his lung. The other had shattered his shoulder joint. His eyes glistened fem feverishly. An open gas mask hung on his chest. He could hardly move, speak or breathe. We shook hands, and I said a few words. Everty could not stay here. Every minute the British could come to the assault, or a shell could finish the remains of the destroyed dugout, the most I could do for my brother was to get him out of here at once. Although Zanfos was against any weakening of our fighting force, I still instructed the five soldiers who had come with me to take Fritz to the Columbus Egg dugout and bring men from there to rescue the other wounded. We wrapped him in a cloak tent and slipped a long pole, which two men took on their shoulders. A shake of hands and the sad procession moved on its way. I watched the wobbling load as it circled the columns of explosions growing to the sky. Each rupture made me flinch as the small group disappeared in the haze of battle. I felt like a man both replacing my mother and responsible to her for my brother's fate. For some time I exchanged fire from the funnels at the front edge of the forest with the gradually advancing British and spent the night with my men and machine gun crew in the ruins of the concrete shelter. In the vicinity of the incessant pounding of high explosive shells of monstrous weight, one of them almost killed me in the evening.
In the morning, our machine gunner suddenly began to whistle because some dark figures were approaching. It turned out to be a patrol of infantry regiment liaisons. One of them was struck dead. Such mistakes often happened in these days. No one especially indulged in thinking about it. At six o'clock, we were succeeded by a part of the Ninth Company, from which I received orders to station myself in battle positions at Fort Rattenburg. On the way there a shrapnel bullet put another of my fanononkers out of action. To me, Fort Rattenburg was a concrete block structure, bearing the marks of many shellings. It stood at the very marshy bed of Stony Creek, well deserving of the name. Quite exhausted, we entered the fort and threw ourselves on straw-lined bunks until a hearty meal, and then a refreshing pipe of tobacco brought us to our senses. Towards evening the bombardment with shells of heavy and super-heavy calibre began. From six to eight o'clock the explosions followed one after another. Sometimes the whole structure shook because of nauseating shocks from unexploded shells falling nearby, threatening to collapse. At this time there was usually talk about the strength of our shelter. The concrete ceiling seemed quite secure, but as the fort stood right on the steep bank of the creek, there was a fear that some heavy shell flying along the steep trajectory would hit us and bring us down with all those concrete blocks. When the fire began to subside in the evening, I crept across the heights, over which shrapnel bullets were whirring and swarming, to the Columbus Egg dugout to ask the doctor, who was examining a dying man's ghastly-looking leg, about my brother. I was glad to hear that he had been sent to the rear in comparatively good condition. It was late when a group of men on duty appeared and brought our little company, reduced to twenty men, hot food, canned meat, coffee, bread, tobacco and schnapps. We ate heavily and, unencumbered by differences of rank, let a bottle of liquor go round. Then we sank into sleep, which was, however, rather restless because of the mosquito clouds coming from the stream, as well as ordinary and even chemical shells. At the end of this restless night, I fell so soundly asleep that my men had to wake me, when in the morning the increasing fire began to alarm them. They reported that the men who had fallen back from the advanced units were claiming that the front had been given up and that the enemy were advancing. According to the old soldier's rule first, get your strength up, then get your wits about you. I had a quick breakfast, put a pipe in my mouth and looked outside. The whole neighbourhood was shrouded in dense smoke. The fire was growing stronger by the minute and had reached the point where anxiety unable to grow any further was replaced by an almost cheerful indifference. A hail of lumps of clay drummed without respite on our roof and twice the house was covered with fire. Incendiary shells threw up dense milky white clouds. From them flames flowed to the ground. A clump of such a phosphorus mass fell on a stone at my feet and burned for a minute. Later we heard that the men hit by it were rolling on the ground, unable to put out the fire. The time bombs rumbled into the ground with a rumbling thud whipping up flat earth mushrooms. Clouds of gas and wisps of fog hung over the field. Ahead, not far from us, gun and machine gun fire sounded. A sign that the enemy had come very close. Down along the creek bed, a rippling forest of geysers of Tina that soared upward. A detachment of men was marching. I recognised the battalion commander, Captain von Brixen. He was walking with a bandaged arm, leaning on two orderlies. I hurried toward him. He hastily shouted that the enemy was advancing and ordered me to return to cover. Soon the first bullets of the riflemen were already flying into the surrounding craters or crashing against the remains of the walls. More and more fleeing figures disappeared in the smoke behind us, while the frantic rifle fire testified to the fierce defence of those held in front. It was time for action. I determined to defend the fort and made it clear to my men, which made the faces of some of them draw up suspiciously. That retreat was out of the question. The team was stationed at the loopholes, our single machine gun set up by the wind. One crater was declared a medical station and an orderly put in there. He had a lot of work at once. I too picked up a derelict rifle from the ground and hung a sliver of ammunition around my neck. 